I'm going to dive in today to one of the, oh, what, what would be called in the seminary, a fighting text. Okay? Where you get more controversy and commotion over, and I'm going to want us to look at it. Today we'll probably do more of what we call good old-fashioned uh, a Bible study and sermon less. All right? So we're going to look at some things in Scripture. Um, by the way, when you picture God looking down on you, what does that look like to you? What do I mean by that? Um, you know, there's a, there's a song, Angels Watching Over Me, My Lord. You ever heard that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? How many of you have ever riding along, driving along on the road, and, well, of course, this happens to me some because my hearing isn't real good. But I can't tell you how many times I've been driving along on the road and all of a sudden look up and there's the, the, the red lights or the blue lights or whatever going. And my first thought is, what did I do? Most of the time, it doesn't take long and they're by me. And I was going, oh, well, that was a lot of worry for nothing. You know, do you, you ever have that happen? You know, like, well, what did I do? And I'm back to, when we think about angels watching over me, what's that feel like? That's supposed to be a comfort. That's supposed to be a good thing. But it seems sometimes some of us that have grown up in conservative Christianity the idea that the angels are watching over us, and I know people that are literally scared to death that the angels are watching us and taking record, that they're just kind of, does anybody think about that? You know, it's kind of oh, a little intimidating that they're taking record. I want to talk about that a little bit today because we're going to talk about what does it mean to be in the Spirit. We're going to talk about being in the Spirit. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? We'll start out in the fighting text. Take your Bible. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. What in the world does it mean to be in the Spirit? And who in the seminary, you can get into all sorts of fancy discussions on this one. All sorts of heated discussions on this one. What in the world is it to be in the Spirit? I'm going to move you around in some places in, in Scripture as we look at some things. But in the process, keep your eye on, keep watching the issue of the Spirit, if you will. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And we probably ought to start with the therefore. What in the world does therefore mean? When I say, what does therefore mean? What I mean is, when you see the therefore, does that mean new thought or continuous thought? The book of Romans was not written with chapters and verse in it. It's written as a letter. How many of you have ever written a letter? How many of you have written a letter with chapters and verses in it? We usually just kind of let it flow, don't we, when we're writing a letter? Who'd ever think of putting in chapters and verses in it? By the way, I'm glad that we're, chapters and verses are in the Scripture because that makes it handy to find things. They added that later to make it easier to find things, but the original was not written with chapters and verses in it. It was a flowing thought. Sometimes it would help us to remember that. Keep your eye on it. There is, take the therefore out for right now as we move along. There is no condemnation to those are in, who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of death. Uh, another word to keep your eye on. We look at it a little different. By the way, you ever heard the old story there's a joke about what journalists, what it means to be a journalist. The joke goes something like this. What it means to be a journalist is, let me see if I can get the two of you to fight so I can have something to write about. Okay? That is to say, the journalist 
job is to kind of be the one to navigate and to report and to kind of judge on who was right or who was wrong. Just kind of get the story out there that way, okay? Um, here's where the fighting comes in. To those who walk according to. Too often, we Christians like to say, oh, okay, being in the Spirit is about walking. And my job is to watch you walk and make sure you're doing it well enough. Or to grade you on your walking. And I would suggest that is not at all what's being talked about here. Could I suggest something else too? My picture of God is not that God is watching to grade how I'm walking either. Can I say that? My picture of God is not is the opposite of God watching with the idea of grading my walk. Let it flow. Just flow with it. Verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now you look at verse 6 there, is it fair to say... Uh, verse 7, for to be carnally minded, 6 and 7 talks about to be carnally minded. Is it fair to say, he's using, if you're just following along from the first few verses, he talks about being in the spirit and being spiritually minded, and he uses carnally minded as being the same thing as being in the flesh. Does that, is that a fair way to put it, as he's just following along? So to be fleshly minded is to be carnally minded. Does that make sense? in putting that together? He's, he's, in other words, can he use different words, can he use metaphors or similes to be saying kind of the same thing? Isn't that what's going on here? Does that seem fair enough? Okay. In other words, let's not get all tangled up in the specifics of the word. Let's flow the concept of the thought. Does that make sense? And the issue here is contrasting being the flesh or the before Christ or, and the being in the spirit or being in Christ. Is that a fair way to put it? Can I do that? Okay. Then I'm going to keep coming back to that over and over again in the context as we keep reading along here. Um, verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh or carnally minded cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed in the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And again, what does that mean? You are dead if you are in Christ. He's not talking about bad body. We get into that sometimes. That's a concept that gets thrown. You're not talking about bad body, and I can prove it. Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Back it up to chapter 6. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may, uh, may abound? No. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by, by the glory of, of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If you're baptized, are you dead? Well, spiritually you're supposed to be newness of life. But are, does that mean dead, bad body? No, it's a metaphor, it's an illustration of the old me is dead and buried, the new me that comes up is new in Christ Jesus, right? It's not about bad body. He's talking about 
As sinful beings in a sinful world, we have mortal bodies that are subject to death. We are mortal. We are not immortal in Christ, okay? We are mortal, but the focus here is the contrast in chapter 8 is before Christ, after Christ. That's the contrast. Does that make sense? In the, in the flesh, in the spirit. So to be in the spirit is to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, by the way. Watch in the verses that we look at, and we'll look up a few more as we go along. But watch in these verses. The discussion is really, the focal point really keeps coming back to Christ. Romans chapter 8, it keeps talking about in the spirit, in the spirit, in the spirit but it's talking about it in the context of the first verse. What's it say? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The focus of the Spirit is always in the context of being in Christ. Does that make sense? But what does it mean to be in the Spirit? Let me try something on you. I could. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? Now, I know the Bible says, and I believe, that the Bible was written by the Holy Spirit, okay? But when I ask you this question, I'm asking it from a human standpoint. Who is the human that wrote the book of Romans? I believe the Apostle Paul was, okay? Now, if we're going to ask, what did Paul mean when he talks about being in the Spirit in Romans chapter 8, would it make sense that we go to other books where the Apostle Paul is doing the writing? Could we do that? Would that make sense? Would that help if we look like we have context? Would you go to Ephesians with me? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints that are in Ephesus, and faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, by the way. It says there, his plan was that we'd be adopted through Jesus Christ. Back to Romans chapter 8. We didn't get to it yet, we didn't read it, but verse 15, what does it say? It says you are called to adoption through Jesus Christ into the family of God by adoption. Same subject, okay. Moving on in Ephesians, you're adopted, you're predestined. God's plan is that you be adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ as sons by Christ Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 5, verse 6, to the praise and glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood through the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed to himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather to himself uh, one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you trusted, verse 13, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a guarantee of your inheritance until the redemption of the purpose, purpose possession to the praise of his glory. What's going on here? How many, when you accept Jesus Christ, what does it say? You, have, you are a member of his family. You have been adopted into the family of God. And you have the promise of being remade and being in heaven with him. Does that make sense? Are you there yet? No. Have you gotten your inheritance yet? Are you there yet? 
Have you gotten the, have, have, you, have, have you gotten it yet? Have you arrived yet? I would say no. Okay? I don't know about you, but I'm still very much hanging around in a sinful world. And I get reminders of it regularly. How many of you go to the doctor more often than you want to? I'm back to, have you arrived yet? Haven't gotten it yet. Haven't gotten that possession of that new immortal body in heaven with Jesus. Have not gotten it yet. Okay? But what do we have? Have any of you ever bought a house? Have you ever bought a house? Okay? How many of you, when you buy a house, just sit down? How many of you buy a two or three or four hundred thousand dollar house and just say, oh, cool, I'll write you a check for it? Most of us, it doesn't quite work like that, does it? When you go to buy a house, what do you do? You usually say, okay, I'm going to buy that house. Now, hold on a minute, because I've got to go to the bank and work out mortgages and all that kind of stuff, right? Isn't that what most of us have to do? Now, to do that, we say to the seller, we say, wait a minute, hold that house, but I'm going to give you something. What? We say, I'm going to give you some earnest money, a deposit, to hold that while I go and work out getting my other financing. Does that make sense? That's straight what Paul is talking about here. You haven't gotten your inheritance in heaven yet. But because of that, God has given us a, a guarantee. A seal. It's, it's, he's using the language of the courts of a land transaction. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Now here's my argument, what I'm saying to you. Move that back to what he's talking about in Romans chapter 8. Oh, and by the way, by the way, Ephesians there, Ephesians chapter 1. What's the biggest part of the discussion? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it Christ? It's all about Christ. Your salvation is in Christ, it is because of Christ. It is because of his blood. It is all Christ. And because of him, you have an inheritance. Furthermore, he says, and it's waiting for you. But you haven't gotten there yet. But don't worry about that. Don't panic. You're still in a sinful world, but you have the Holy Spirit given as the down payment, as the guarantee that your inheritance isn't being passed off to somebody else. Does that make sense? 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. Verse 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. When I moved here, two years ago, a little over two years ago, moved here, was invited to come and have an interview with this board about whether, whether you all would hire me as your pastor. Met with the board, met with several of you there. We had a discussion together, but I came from 2,000 miles away we came in, flew in, had a conversation with you, and the process, I got to spend about two hours with a realtor looking around. Found out housing is a little different in Phoenix than it is in Western North Carolina. And the other thing is, have you ever gone, have you ever gone with a realtor to look at a house? Now, I know some of you here are the realtors. I don't mean to insult you, but I will tell you that when you go to look at a house, it's been my experience anyway, since I'm usually, I'm one of those that when I go to look at a house, I kind of have to live within a budget. Any of you ever had to deal with that? You know, I have to figure out what I'm going to get within a budget. And it has been my limited experience that when you tell the realtor, here's what I want, but I need to be within this budget, you will find every piece of trash that is on the market within that budget. That's been my experience. In other words, the first few times of going and looking is about the most discouraging time on earth. 
Have, am I the only one that has experienced that? You know, you say, We're gonna get, I, need, I need to find a place within this budget. And it's, and it's as if you realtors, I suspect a conspiracy. <laughs> because sure as the world, after a couple of days of that, I start thinking about my budget and they're thinking, I got to do a little better than this. Am I the only one that's been in that position? And I think you realtors do it that way on purpose. I'm teasing. Well, anyway, we came here. We looked around with the realtor. And got on a plane and flew 2,000 miles away. Our realtor kept looking. The house that Jenny and I and our two kids live in, we bought sight unseen. The realtor called and said, I think we've got, with what, in what you're talking about, I think I found the right place. And we got all excited, oh good, we're going to have a place to lay our head when we get there. He called back a couple hours later and said, nope, that's not it. Oh. And then he said, but I've been looking more and I think I found another one and that's the one that we're in now. And he says, that's called back a couple hours later and said, that's the one, you need to get it. And we went ahead and got it. Signed put the down payment down, and then we had to wait. Well, some of you may remember, I came out here for about three weeks together, drove out here, was here without my family, and then went back to finish up there, and then coming back. When I was here those three weeks, I knew about that piece of property. My mom already lived out here. She was staying with my, my brother, and she was so excited. I wouldn't even tell her the address. <laughs> oh, it had her upset. But she was so excited. I was a little excited too. You know, the, the, you Arizonans, everything you put, when you have a house, you seem to put block up in the backyard. That's a new one to me, but I'm used to it. And I go, okay, you know, I kind of like it now. But I wanted to go see this place. But it wasn't my house yet, so I couldn't go in or do any of that. So, so what I did was start snooping around out in the back. I wanted to see what the backyard looked like. What, you know, I heard there was a... I'd heard there was a pool, and I had heard there was a, a, a porch in the back there, and I wanted to see it. So I went out there, and I'm looking around, just kind of being a casual neighbor, and I'm looking around a little bit, and, and you, that wall is high. And so I thought, wait, you know, so I actually did my, stick my hands on top of the wall and jump and look up a little bit and then fall. I was like I was on a pogo stick, you know, just kind of up and down, hopping around, trying to be able to get myself a little bit of time to see in there and see what was going on. And then, whoop, couldn't hold myself so I back, go back down and jump again. Did that a bunch of, I'm checking out the backyard. But it wasn't mine yet. Ever been there? Life in the Spirit is for any... Romans 8, he says it. He says, you are not the ones that are in the flesh. I'm talking to you that are Christians. You are the ones in the Spirit. You that are in the Spirit are the ones that have accepted Jesus as your Savior have been promised the guarantee of eternal life, but haven't gotten it yet. But you do have the down payment, the deposit, which is the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be in the Spirit. In the Spirit is, I have Jesus, but I haven't arrived yet but I do have the down payment. And when I have that down payment, that is the promise that this thing isn't going to get sold out from under me. And that's what John is saying when he says, in, that's John chapter 6. John chapter 6. It's verse 37, John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. 
and the one who comes to me, I will no wise cast out. It's about assurance. Being in the Spirit is about the assurance that I've got the down payment, and even though I don't feel like I'm in heaven yet, I still feel the aging process more than I want to admit. In my case, my ears still don't work, but I've got the down payment of the Holy Spirit. That's being in the Spirit. Now, something else about being in the Spirit. What does that mean? Does that mean God is out there in the business looking for an opportunity to try and kick me out? No, it means just the opposite. It means, by the way, any of you... Anybody have you ever anybody know anybody that's been or know of a family that adopted a child? You know some people that have adopted a child? How many times did they adopt that child? You mean they weren't adopted and then unadopted and then adopted again and then unadopted and adopted again and then unadopted? Huh? Most of you are gonna say, wait a minute relationships don't work that way when you've been adopted you're in the family there's not in and out based on how you do and how you're not doing in fact it's kind of the other way around Romans chapter 8 is not in and out based on how I'm doing how I walk it's not about how I'm walking is being watched and being observed as far as it's actually kind of the other way around I had a friend of mine, pastor, I mean, when I was pastoring in a, another church a long time ago, we came to this church and this, this lady was coming to church and her husband wasn't coming very much. And I got to talking with her some and she said, well, would you talk with my husband? Now understand, this guy is a, um, uh, this guy is an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister and he had lost his job, okay? He wasn't coming to church a whole lot. And his wife says, she wanted him, wanted me to talk to him. And he was very, very, very reticent. I didn't really want to, but I don't know what she did to him, but anyhow, she got him somehow and he was sitting in my office. Very much not wanting to be there, I felt, okay? But we're talking. And as we're talking, he's sharing his story of his experience. And I think I could put it in this, sum it up kind of like this. You know, as far as feelings go, he was a little bit embarrassed, a little bit ticked off, a little bit scared, a little bit... His emotions were kind of all over the place. You know, if you've been around something like that where sometimes emotions are kind of all over the place and, and, and kind of feeling treated unfairly, okay? And I said, tell me your story. And we got to talking and talking along. And as he's telling me a story, I, I kind of went, huh? And I said, well, is there something else? And I do that, tend to do that anyway. You know, tell me the story. Well, is that all? That's kind of, that's even kind of a, psychological technique you kind of use you know is there anything you know finish the story tell the rest of your story is there anything else and what what he didn't know was and I tried very hard not to let him know is I'm sitting there kind of going what that was all but I can't go there so I'm you know what else he says no that's pretty well it well now I got a problem how do we get this restore this guy without being in the direction of saying well you were treated bad or whatever but how do we get past this thing and, and try and alleviate some of his frustration and anger. And, uh, you know, how do we get past this? And I'm, I'm just perfectly thinking, now what? Because a part of me is kind of saying, huh? Well, I got an idea. He, I don't know how I had known it, but I, I remembered that I had, I had seen his email address. And so I switched gears on him. I said, tell me your email address. 
what? Why do you want to know that? Well, just tell me, what's your email address? His email address was Henry's daddy at such and such, such and such, such and such. Okay? Now, here's the story of what was going on. He'd gotten struggling with his finances. And in his discouragement and struggling with his finances, he had gotten involved with... He, was, he would leave his family for days at a time and would head to the casino and was trying to get his money back that way. Well, needless to say, by doing that, he was ending up on, you know, this was, he was making things worse instead of better. And he, when people found out what he was doing, they really got frustrated. And when his leaders got involved, they really got frustrated. And they were talking to him. And before long, and he kept, uh, anyway, and now he's on the outside looking in. I didn't want to get into a discussion about whether it's okay to go to a casino or not. That, just, that was just going to be a loser that I didn't want to get. Yeah, that was just trouble. So how do we get in this discussion? Tell me your email address. My email address is Henry's daddy at such and such, such and such. I said, why did you pick that for your email address? He said, because that is the most incredible thing in my life is the joy of being Henry's daddy and I put it on my email address I said do you want Henry to grow up to be addicted to the casino no I said then what in the world are you doing there That's all I said. What are you doing there? Changed his whole focus and his whole approach to looking at things. One silly comment. He was expecting me to yell at him and to play holier than thou. And I said, I'm not going to argue about whether that's a place to be or whether it's not. What in the world are you doing there as Henry's daddy? Could I suggest to you that's the way daddy, that's the way God deals with us? Have you ever been in your Christian relationship where you've got it all straight and things are going to go good now and oops, it didn't go as well as I thought? Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had, okay, today I've got the intention it's going to be, we're going to do just fine, I got this straight. We would put it in this comment, in this situation. You know, can't tell you how many people I've had. New Year's resolution. Today, I quit smoking. Yeah, I did it several times. And still didn't accomplish much. Or you put it any subject you want, whatever it was. We're good intentions at the beginning of the day. And at the end of the day, it didn't go like it was supposed to. If you've ever had that experience, then you can understand Romans 7, that is the therefore, that is the Romans 8, because that's exactly what Paul is saying. What I intended to do, it didn't work out. What I intended, I was certainly not going to do. There I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And it seems to me like you want to hear some fancy theological discussions, deal with that one. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But folks... I would suggest it's as simple as, where am I ever going to get deliverance from my mortalness that keeps getting in my way of my intentions? You ever been there? Remember who you are in Christ Jesus. And you have the Holy Spirit that is your reminder as your down payment of what you have been promised. But God isn't going to be blessing you out if it doesn't go the way you want it, and I can prove it. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. You have one Elijah the prophet who has been up on Mount Carmel because God told him to go there. Before, the, before then, he went and pounded on Ahab's door, the king, because God told him to. And then he went to the 
to the brook and he was there because God told him to. And he went to a lady that wasn't even Jewish to help feed him because God told him to. And then he was up on Mount Carmel because God told him to. And then that night he went to bed. And somebody startled him awake. And all of a sudden the brave Elijah the prophet is running for his life. And he's ticked off, and he's embarrassed, and he's tired, and he's hungry, and he's mad, and he isn't doing real well. Let's just say he had a bad day. If he had a chance to think about it, he could say, like Paul said in Romans 7, and who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And what was God's question to him? Did God bless him out and say, you idiot, you failed me, you did whatever. What did God say to him? All God said is, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are we doing here? I sent you to that mountain. What are we doing on this mountain, Elijah? And notice what God did. God gave him some rest. God fed him. God did give him a couple illustrations. And then God said, what do you say we go back and try again, Elijah? Isn't that all he did? You see, God had every opportunity to go, you blew it, you. But what did God do? What are we doing here, Elijah? What are we doing here? Now, why don't we go back where we were supposed to be? By the way, Hebrews 12 tells us that God loves us like a parent loves a child. How many of you remember back when your kids were little? Man. My memory is they'll erp all over you. They'll keep you up at night. They'll yell at the wrong times. When they're figuring out how to dress themselves, they'll come out naked when you'd really least expect it. Embarrass the daylights out of you, and we haven't even gotten to diapers yet. More than once, most of us have thought, I can't take this anymore. But now that's all just stuff to laugh about. God loves his children a lot more than we love ours. And if little things like diapers don't bother you, why in the world do you think they bother God? Now don't take that to mean I'm saying, oh, okay, go send it up, it won't matter, do whatever. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying God will say, what are you doing here, Elijah? To encourage betterness. But God is not standing there over watching, judging, to see if he can zap you. That's just not where his game is. In the spirit means we can make it complicated if we want to. I would make it simple. Romans is talking about in the Spirit means in a relationship with Jesus Christ where the Holy Spirit is the down payment, the deposit on the eternity that we have not inherited yet. But that is promised, signed, sealed, and soon to be delivered. 
That's what in the Spirit means. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians 1. And that's what Paul says in Romans 8. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. And I mean, 2 Corinthians 1. And that's what Paul says is in 2 Corinthians 5. He uses that same expression over and over and over again. The Spirit is the deposit or the down payment on the inheritance that you have not collected yet. That's what in the Spirit is. Because God loves you and will not leave you sitting there desolate because you haven't gotten your inheritance yet. That's how much your God loves you. And you don't need to let the Scripture scare you into thinking God's saying something that He's not. Because if God wanted to give up on us, He would have done that a long time ago. Our God is in the loving, saving business. Paul says you are predestined to be saved. God's plan is to save you, not send you off out away. Because you're his children. That's what our God is like. The Spirit is a blessing to remind us of the big blessing that we haven't inherited yet. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, you're coming back to reunite us. And thank you that until then, we have the Holy Spirit as a down payment on that promise. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that you gave us the Spirit as a deposit. May our lives show that we trust this Jesus is our prayer in his name. Amen.